somebody gave me an article about the story. I hadn't heard about it when it happened. And just the, the absurdity, the, the dark comic absurdity of one of the wealthiest men in America bringing um, a team of wrestlers onto his estate to train where he would become their coach without knowing anything about wrestling. Um, it, it, was, it was funny, uh, except the outcome was uh, horrible. And it's one of these things, the more you look at it, the more it speaks to you and, and all of the themes within it. Uh, it was, you know, class, wealth, entitlement, all of these things just getting concentrated into what is essentially a very small story and uh, compelling. Many people stepped forward to help us. Uh, the person who conducted those interviews and assembled those documentaries, his name is David Doc Bennett, and he's actually in the film. He's the one that's conducting the interviews with DuPont and uh, with Dave, meaning with Mark Buffalo. That's the actual guy, and he was the person who gave us all of that footage. But I hardly encountered a person who was not generous in sharing whatever it was that they had. Greg Frazier, our cinematographer, was fantastic. Not just a great talent, um, but also a great person whose sensitivities and care were as important as his very excellent eye. You know, sometimes it happens that you work with a person who doesn't quite know what they're looking at through the lens. You know, it's it's color and composition. And if you don't know what you're looking at, that you're watching two brothers separating, or any one of the thousand vital moments, if you don't know what you're looking at, and if you're not feeling it, if the eye of the, the camera operator is not feeling, you know, feeling it, um, you, don't, you don't know how to like the thing. You don't know where the camera belongs. And for us to have that dialogue uh, meant that we could both be seeing and feeling the story at the same time. And so he, he's a fantastic, uh, fantastic cinematographer and a fantastic you know, person. And I think all of us really did share uh, our own versions of that, of exploring, struggling to know, you know, a deeper level of the truth. There's quite a bit of evidence uh, and research that our production designer, Jess Gonshore, is in the third film with him. We did Capone Moneyball. Um, he, he just went very deep with it, and in most cases, uh, came up with a pretty close approximation. But a lot of this is available, you know, if you were searching online, you could see quite a bit of the real thing. The performance does conceal something, and that it does leave that to somewhat. And that the various desires in the film could very easily spill over and dominate, you know, as you pointed out, as could so many of the themes and so many other elements. It could very easily tip over into like a drug thing, or like, was there some kind of like sexuality that was you know, always about that, or is it a nervousy thing? But when these things become too dominant, flagrant or spectacular, I find that they sort of erase the allegory uh, and they invite a kind of conclusion to things. And the film very much doesn't want to, uh, you know, wave its finger at the audience and conclude anything, uh, rather to keep staring at these things uh, that tempt us, I think, to react, to conclude, to you know, label and designate and good and evil. And, you know, and sometimes making a film like this, you know, you're very tempted towards the low-hanging fruit. You, know, you feel like a cat 
or it's a bat, dangling feather or something. Because, but that's cheap. And to restrain from that and just go, okay, but then what's behind that and what's behind that? Uh, and and for, to allow the space for every character to make the best case for that character and, and hopefully witness something behind uh, the dynamic that resulted in this terrible conclusion.